Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's eSpeaks, we're looking at the future of artificial intelligence infrastructure. Along the way, we're discussing large language models, the cloud, private data centers, and data analytics, a lot of big ideas all related to AI. To discuss that, I'm joined by Ed Enough, Chief Product Officer at Datastax, and happy Friday too, and, and, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, thank you, James. It's been uh, it's great to be here with you today. You know, it's, it's really interesting to me that uh, obviously we've seen this enormous upswell in artificial intelligence ever since ChatGPT debuted at the end of 2022. And it's AI is not really new, but it seems like there's a new awareness of it going on. Um, so as you survey how AI is affecting your business, what are a couple of key trends you see here in this year? Well, so a couple of different things. So first, obviously, we're all very um, uh, amazed and, and everybody has, has this heightened awareness of what's possible with generative AI and the large language models. And those are super exciting. And we've, we're seeing, um, you know, just a, a huge amount of adoption uh, of them, particularly over the last six months. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I do like to, to remind people is, is that AI adoption has really been happening over the last two years. And a lot of that has been around uh, real-time predictive AI. And in fact, um, when I say over the last two years, that's been among sort of mainstream businesses and Fortune 500 companies. Obviously, companies like Uber have been uh, building their services on top of, of real-time AI. Predictive AI is, is tends to be the way that it's described um, over the last you know, five, 10 years, actually. Right, right. Um, and, and that's that's gone through, you know, a number of different terms where we're really sort of predicting that next action or telling you when your car is going to arrive and all of that. Mm -hmm. oh, what about, all right, was, was there another one in there? I don't want to interrupt you. Was there another trend that you saw? Um, well, I think the second thing, of course, is is now really, you know, how do we uh, how do we embrace um, these within the application tier? So a lot of a lot of what we've been seeing with AI use cases have been things that have been uh, being driven by data scientists and data engineers. Um, and now a lot of the, the, the tooling, the, the open source, the commercial products um, are actually increasingly targeting the application developer. And you see that, that the application developers in general are becoming very fluent in these technologies. So a combination of them becoming more knowledgeable as well as as the bar being lowered in terms of of the complexity of adopting these, so now it's almost sort of any developer you talk you talk to um, is able to be productive and leverage this in some way. Like calling a GPT API is something that that almost any developer can can do and and can be productive in doing. So that means that applications are getting AI um in all sorts of ways and so that's really exciting it means that that we're just seeing this all over the place you know it's, i think it's a really interesting point when you think about large language models models of which of course you know, chat gtp is, is an example they change how developers work in a couple of ways one, one of course is the idea of low code no code really the democratization of tech and so you you don't necessarily need to be a, a highly experienced highly educated developer you can get in there and tweak the application you, you might be a regional sales manager, you might be a, you know, a, a mid-level executive, and suddenly, you know, low code, no code is, is democratizing technology. So even the idea, I mean, developers are working differently, but even the definition of who is a developer is, is changing. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think you're seeing um, uh, a couple of things in relation to that. So first, um, AI is making, and LLMs in particular under the hood, um, are making, uh, no code style or low code or no code style automation much easier because again, it makes it possible to build tools that are more sort of do what I mean type of, of an experience and, and right. do what I mean is, is a, uh, you know, expression that, that has been around for many years from a product design standpoint, but now it's actually the reality. And so, so it definitely is, um, is making that possible. That said, we're also seeing that just developers who are generating or writing code 
also have a lot of tools at their disposal that make it possible to do a tremendous amount more work and to just increase levels of productivity. And whether they're just going into ChatGPT and asking it to, to write the project for them, building a web application, doing things like that, you get very high quality uh, results. Some people will point out and say, oh, sometimes the code needs to be edited by hand, but um, you know, it still is a massive uptake in productivity. And honestly, you ask any software developer and their first version of what they write doesn't work out of the box either. So, right. so the fact that they've got to go and hand edit some of what they get from GPT is, is not a problem. Um, and then you've got tools like Copilot, um, which the, plug the, the into the your development tool. environment. Exactly. The GitHub tool, which, which also make, you know, you start writing what you want to do and it starts auto-completing based on what it's seen studying all of this code. So the, the productivity for whether it's at the, the no code, low code level, which as you said, just making it possible for a power user, right? Somebody who may not be, you know, may not be a coder, but they know how to express what they want the process to be. Um, or, for, for the developer who does need to build a bunch of stuff. Now, maybe I don't need a huge team. Maybe I just need a developer who has kind of a vision of what their application needs to be. And they can get large swaths of the code built for them and they and makes them immediately more productive. So it allows every developer to be a, a 10X developer or even a 100X developer. Um, and so that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that trend toward the, democr the democratization of tech has certainly been a mega trend that is going on for a while. But, I, you know, the, the large language models do accelerate that. Um, well, let's look at it from a different angle. What, what about those companies that they, they need to retain their data uh, for any number of reasons, regulatory yeah. compliance? They need to retain their data in their private data center. And we still have them. Not everyone is on, on the cloud 100 percent. It's even a reality here in 2023. How can those yeah. companies best implement artificial intelligence? So that's a um, that's that's an interesting um, challenge. And so, first of all, I will say that there is no question that AI um, is going to be sort of the second shooter drop, maybe depending on the time horizon you look at, maybe the sh third shooter drop in terms of, of uh, I don't know if that's an analogy, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, but but I'll coin it here anyway. Uh, sure. The, 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 um, you know, we we saw a, um, you know, with the pandemic, we saw sort of that accelerated transition to cloud. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, and. AI is going to be that next wave accelerating transition to cloud. And the reason for that is um, what makes all of these AI um use cases possible are the size of the models, hmm. the size of the ML models mm -hmm. that are being used to power them. And that those la large models, I'm not specifically saying large language models, just large models in general, Right. Um, they require GPUs. Yes. Graphics, graphics processing units. Those are what make it possible to accelerate the matrix math that makes doing these things possible. Right. And by and large, most enterprises don't have a, um, a, a, a whole bunch of these GPUs. They're created by NVIDIA. There's other things. Google has something called a tensor processing unit. Um, Microsoft and, and AWS have, have their own analogs to that. But by and large, what they do is they use racks and racks of these GPUs. And that's what makes this possible. And if you look at, for example, OpenA OpenAI has mm -hmm. spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this hardware. Right. Um, and so so generally, if you want this stuff, it's in the cloud. Yes. Now, um, that said, a lot of the early AI was built um, really from the standpoint of let's get this stuff out the door very quickly. And so what you're now seeing is a lot of optimizations that are happening. And you're actually seeing that it's possible to take these models and actually um, run them on, on your iPhone um, or for that matter, within, within the data center. And there's some companies, there's some startups, um, companies like... Um, uh, there's a company called Third AI and a few other startups that are that are um, uh, also going and figuring out 
how to run these models more efficiently on the hardware that's already within the data center. So my my prediction is it will be possible to do these large models and large language models on, in the data center. But right now, um, if you really want to do this stuff and you want to deliver applications and experiences that are powered by this stuff, the cloud is the place to do it. So, so it really depends on your time horizon. I think it's going to light a fire. It has lighted a fire under moving more data to the cloud. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of reasons, as you pointed out, why some of that data can't get to the cloud very quickly. And so, so you will see some options um, for for people who have medical data, pri privacy intensive data that that can't go there, but it's going to slow things down and i think that that a lot of companies are really you know making the, the 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 prediction and the call where they go and say look this is this is the final this is really sort of the 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 you know uh, the final straw we need to figure out how we get that data to the cloud mm -hmm. and so 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 uh, there's going to be a little bit of push pull around this and, yeah, and it'll be the biggest thing Go ahead, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, this is this. If you, when I talk to CIOs and when I talk to IT leaders, this is every one of them is grappling with this. The, the issue of where, whether or not their own facilities have the processing power to really run AI and, and how to, you know, so to speak, import yeah. that AI into their own data. Okay, that's a that's a huge issue. All right, it's I, a I huge issue. Data. Data has gravity, and generally, you want to bring your AI to the data. And if that data, and if the data is not in a place where the AI can run, you've got a problem. Right, right. I want to clarify one point. You said something fascinating, kind of in passing. You're talking about running a running these models on your phone. You meant, I'm assuming, in sort of a SaaS uh, SaaS scenario, the the phone was logging onto a system and the user was running it. You know, seeing the user interface on the phone. Or did you mean literally running it on your phone? I mean literally running it. So this is this is where um, uh, you know it's fascinating how fast things are moving. But a few weeks ago. Um, uh, uh, um, actually earlier than that, but, but, if, but a few weeks ago, you, you actually had, uh, a couple of open source projects, um, actually released the means for compiling a model so that it can run on the neural processor that's on the iPhone. Wow. Um, and they took one of the models, one of the large language models, one that's called, uh, uh, Vicuna 13B, so it's a 13 billion parameter model, mm -hmm. and they actually released an iPhone app. I have it on my app. It's not as full featured as GPT, but it actually lets you do, um, uh, you know, GPT, GPT, chat GPT style interactions running entirely locally on your iPhone, and yeah. um, and so so you, you're going to see more of that. First of all, what, what is the name of the app? If you don't mind saying. Um, so this particular one is um, uh, it's part of a project called MLC, which is an ML compiler. And so they released an app called MLC Chat as a proof of concept that allows you to use the, the Vicuna 13B uh, model, which is a, a large language model. Um, and you can just run it on your iPhone. Now, now your iPhone does get very hot while it's running. It, it's using a lot of compute, but it, it actually runs and it runs very quickly. Uh, on on the phone, and so um, uh, you know, I throw that out there as, as an example of just how fast this space is moving. You're going to have these models running in a lot of places, and it's part of what I call the optimization phase of LLM. A lot of what we've seen thus far has been more about the art of the possible, mm -hmm. of going and saying, "Hey, if we have if we go and throw a hundred million dollars worth of of GPUs at something, can we make this?" AI experience nobody dreamed possible. Can we actually make it possible? But now right. you've got a whole wave of, wave of engineers and researchers that are now going and saying, how can we reduce down the size of these models? How can we create means by these models can run on on the hardware that we have? And so, so you're going to see a whole flurry of activity by these optimizers. Uh, what I call these these engineers and developers and researchers who are who are who are um, tackling the optimization problem, and so you're going to be surprised. You are going to see local execution of this stuff. 
You know, that I, I find absolutely fascinating. I, I would almost uh, resort to exaggeration here for a moment and, and say like, running AI on an iPhone feels like a, a moment in hu human history. I mean, who would have thought this little piece of metal in our pocket could actually run artificial intelligence? That's pretty wild. Um, yeah, and I suspect, I, I, I suspect, again, I can't predict, but I suspect that it's something that Apple anticipated, which has been why they've been packing these phones with so much AI specific capabilities. Um, we'll, we'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to like, like everybody, I'm looking forward to Apple's uh, upcoming worldwide developer conference and, and, and seeing if they do more to, to take advantage of it. They certainly have been sponsoring a lot of this, this sort of thing. So, so there might be some interesting things along that line. Again, pure speculation on my part. Sure. You know, that the other idea about running um, artificial intelligence on one's, you know, small phone uh, or powerful phone, actually, is it's it, it again ties into that trend of the democratization of technology. So it's not yes. a mainframe somewhere, you know, staffed by, you know, highly paid data scientists. It's some sort of data scientist. It's a citizen, a citizen developer, uh, a yep. citizen yep. taking action. And then he or she is equipped with artificial <laughs> intelligence on their own you know, phone, which is pretty amazing. Um, yes. Yeah. Well, let's. All right. Well, then we're I was going to ask about the future. We're already in the future. But before I do that, I think we should take a moment and, and talk about data stacks in particular. How is how is data stacks playing in, in this sector? What, what does all this mean to data stacks in, in your view? Well, so it's really exciting for us. Um, so a couple of things. So first of all, again, um, we we firmly believe that that AI needs data. And, and and needs very large data sets. And if you look at where data stacks plays with our Cassandra technology, this is where people go and store their their large data sets. This is why enterprise companies and uh, and technology startups alike uh, select Cassandra and select data stacks uh, again and again. And you look at some of the largest companies in the world. Um, that are leaders in AI. You look at companies like Uber and you look at companies like Netflix, they standardize on Cassandra as their database for storing these large data sets. Right. Um, a lot of that data is real-time event data. And we talked a little bit about real-time AI at the beginning. So um, as companies use these large sets of events, things I click on, things I put in my shopping cart, um, perhaps logistics data, and they want to make predictions as to what's going to happen next, they use these data sets. And so we've been playing within this for a while now, um, both us specifically, you know, as, as, as a company and within our enterprise software and our cloud services, but also just the Cassandra ecosystem that we build on top of has been doing this quite a bit. And so this is pretty exciting for us. Mm -hmm. um, that said, as we've seen generative AI happening, that also requires this set of, of data. And it's these large language models, they use databases like Cassandra to build a history and a memory, right? Mm -hmm. Because when you interact with a large language model, you want it to know all the previous interactions. Right. And so these these services, um, chat type applications, as well as, as um, all of these generative AI use cases, um, they build on top of Cassandra to build that long-term memory. And so we are doing a lot of stuff. Um, uh, you know, we're doing it within open source and we, um, uh, you know, and, in, and it, and with, as I said, within our products to make it possible, if you're using Langchain, if you're building, uh, chat GPT plugins, out of the box, you'll be able to use our cloud services and our open source to empower these. So, so, um, so it's super exciting for us. All of these use cases are data um, intensive, and there's a lot of the properties of NoSQL databases in particular, mm -hmm. as well as the type of database that Cassandra is that lend themselves very, very well for these use cases. So we're all in on it. Interesting. Okay. Really interesting. Um, I want to talk about the future also, but I, I, I want to stop for a moment and then try to formulate this question about who is, what sector, what kind of companies are going to control artificial intelligence the most? The question can't be answered, but I'll try to ask it anyway. So that uh -huh. we, we see the large hyperscalers, they have such sort of gravitational pull because as you say, they, they've got all those racks of, you know, processing power and they've got the, the GPUs lined up, you know, row up to row. And 
So in a sense, one might say the hyperscalers will own the future of artificial intelligence because they have the greatest platforms to really run things. On the other hand, there's a whole host of standalone vendors, data and AI vendors that are doing innovative things. And, you know, so they're doing some pretty interesting things. So who, which of those two camps is going to control the future of artificial intelligence more in your, in your view, if that question could even be asked? Oh, it's, it's a wonderful question to ask. It's a question that a lot of people talk about um, a, a lot. And it, it's interesting. Almost any conversation that I have with other technologists, um, technology leaders, um, this question comes up again and again. And uh-huh. um, the answer is um, it's very hard to predict. And, and the reason why is certainly the hyperscalers have a major role to play. Um, but, you know, about a week ago, there was a there was a whole thing where there was a leaked memo out of Google where one of their researchers raised the question of of do the hyperscalers actually have a competitive moat or mm. is the tension going to shift to open source? There's that's a legitimate question. There's a lot of things happening within open source models. Well, let me where- see. That. I'm sorry to understand the question. Someone asked, do the hyperscalers have a competitive mode? I mean, they are high, they're mode. exceptionally a mode. Oh, mo- oh, mo- oh, M-O-A-T. Thank you. All right. Do that. Yes. Because the yes. nature of open source would, ero- would erode the, the hyperscalers moat, perhaps. Yes, because what's happening is that you're finding that people can take open source models and they can actually enhance them with their own data and build more powerful models that might be better for specific use cases than than the the large models that the hyperscalers are providing. And this is already happening uh, quite a bit in the developer communities. Uh huh. Okay, that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. It is. It is. And then you also have the, the as you pointed out, the startups that are also doing that, where they're creating, um, they're building. They're either their own models or they're actually adapting, um, you know, the the models that they get from the hyperscalers and they're creating better, better uh, services tailored for specific use cases. So my my uh, my personal answer to this question is um, it is there's not going to be one size fits all. It is going to be about going and saying, OK, you know, do I want to build a specific model for um retail engagement or do i want to build a specific model for logistics or do i want to build a specific model for legal documents or do i you know those will be things that startups will tackle open source will tackle some some variants of that um and i think that the the hyperscalers will will continue to do two things one is they will provide the place where all these models run because they do have the hardware and the compute. Um, I, I personally, when I worked at Google, I actually toured one of the data centers, and it's the size of a small town. Right, right. right. It, it literally is. It, I, we we spent you know uh, uh, you know something like two hours walking from one side of it to to the other. Wow. Um, and so 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 that's that's obviously a physical advantage. It's very important. The second thing is they will they will be providers of what are called the foundational models because yes. they need the the large the entire data set or corpus of the web to train these and build them and only a few companies can afford to do that. Right. But you'll have open source models, you'll have domain specific models, you'll have companies doing purpose built training or tuning on top of these foundational models. And so, and then the other thing is, as we talked about, you'll also have versions of these models that are designed to run on, on your iPhone and in other special hardware. Right. And so it's changing every day. It, if, you know, on any given day, I'm trying to keep up with this stuff between, you know, between the morning and by the afternoon, I see five major new announcements or models released or startups announced. Right. It's, it's, a, I've been, you know, for, for folks, I'm sure you're seeing this. I, I've been I've been you know working in tech since since uh, since the early '90s here here in Silicon Valley, and the I haven't seen anything like this since 1994, 1995. It it, it is sort of the internet hitting all over again. I, I agree. Like since November, everything has changed. It's pretty amazing. Yes. 
I mean, the, the world you're, you're, you're portraying, I mean, I think about past decades, going back to the 90s, for example, there were, there were incumbent technology vendors, you know, large enterprise vendors in a certain sector, and they would see a promising startup and they would let that startup get a certain amount of heft and then they would just simply buy that startup. So they could sort of, the, the incumbents would sort of digest the interesting startups. But it feels like in, in the world that you're portraying, there's too many other things going on. If, if, the, if the hyperscalers are now the incumbents, there's almost too much going on for them to simply reach out and digest the interesting startups because there's too much going on. I, I think there'll be some, I think there will be some digestion. I mean, remember, um, uh, you know, if we go back to, again, uh, these historical analogies are imprecise, but, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, Netscape did end up at AOL. Right. And, uh, and, yeah. and so, 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 so you will see, you will see both, um, acquisitions and consolidation, but you'll also see new players that emerge that, um, uh, I'm sure for the next five years, we will see new startups. Some of them already, I mean, obviously we have some examples of open AI and others, um, who, who have emerged, you know, so, I mean, obviously they were working behind the scenes for a while, but to the general public sort of emerged out of nowhere. And right. we'll see a whole slew of those. So it's going to be a really interesting time um, for the, you know, it will be a challenging time for, for you know, the enter it, and an exciting time for the businesses and enterprises that want to adopt this technology. It, it, it'll be just like back in the, the 90s where suddenly every company went from, what's the internet and what's the web to, I need a website. I need a, right. I need, um, I, you know, I'm a retailer. I suddenly need to be selling online. Well, the same thing, like there are companies that, you know, uh, you're, you're going to have a company today that is going to some point in the next six months are going to be like, we have to build a chat GPT plugin. And they're going to be like, what's chat GPT. I mean, right. You know, I mean, right. most people at that point are not going to say that, but, but, you know, it's it's we're at that state where where new things are going to be entering into the mainstream and the people, the leaders who have been representing the the digital transformation or the digital engagement or the digital presence are suddenly have an entirely new front that they have to play within. Um, and and, you know, uh, the last two waves for them might have been mobile. And then before that was you know, the web, I mean, these are, it's, it's going to be on that level of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, totally. And I think, I think you said it, I mean, this week, I could continue on for another three hours, I think, but I, you know, in, in the interest of time, I, I guess I better cut us off, but wow, I, this is yeah. fascinating. Really, really. It's exciting. It's, it, it's it, exciting. It exciting. It's, yeah. 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 It's just like a bit of a gold rush and then who knows what's going to happen with it. And, um, it, yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, I, I guess I, I will allow myself one, one more short query. Is, is there, I mean, I find the whole thing very exciting, but is there not like a little bit of a hint of, of worry slash doom in the whole thing, too? Or is or am I being a naysayer here? I think that there's going to be disruption with, yeah. without a doubt. I, I I don't know the nature of that disruption. There are things we certainly, um, you know, there, there, the, the, there is the obvious thing, which is the ability of these large language models to produce very high quality text. Right. And if you think about it, most of us are knowledge workers of some sort. Right. And yes. and um, and and, you know, we produce content, whether whether we're talking about articles or 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 product requirements or customer, uh, you know, facing marketing content or whatever. All of us, myself included, we, right. we are knowledge workers and and sure. um and, and we we probably you know are all using ChatGPT to some degree to to help uh, refine and and formulate our ideas and and um, and so there'll be some impact on that and certainly um, uh, GPT GPT four is capable of producing very high quality code and so there is a slippery slope between right now a lot of us are using it as an amplification there's a slippery slope between amplification. And elimination, right? Like yes. oh, maybe I just don't meet people at all, right? Um, right. And and it, I, I, it's too soon to tell. It's too soon to tell. It'll it'll be a little bit of both. Is the long and short of it? It will. It will, people who are doing more sort of rote work, um, you know, will will be somewhat challenged. People who use this stuff again, I'm old enough to remember when, you know, being able to use a search engine 
was was both disruptive and and, and but also a, a force multiplier, right? Right. right. You know, and so so there'll be a lot of that. Um, uh, you know, it, we'll all have to keep a close eye on it. I, I'm, it is a legitimate question. I think about it a lot, mm-hmm. um, as does everybody. Um, um, yeah. I, other, other than, you know, I, I, I've lived through a couple of phases of disruption. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and maybe this is the final one. Maybe we're all put out of work. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah. but Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, and, and I think you said it, that that is an open question. And, and all of this it is, in a, in a sense, it's unfolding even as we speak. It is unfolding very rapidly. Uh, at any rate, um, thank you so much for your insight. It was fascinating. I hope you come back and, and talk with us again sometime. I'd love to do it. It's a great conversation. Thank you.